the fallopian tube the fallopian tube is named after gabriel fallopius an italian anatomist who lived between 1523-62 he is the same anatomist who gave his name to the fallopian ligament and the fallopian canal despite the eponym the word fallopian is often used in lower case the fallopian tubes are one of the important reproductive part in females which provide a site for fertilization and are involved in the transportation of ovum from the ovaries to uterus the fallopian tubes are also called as the uterine tubes or the oviducts in this lecture we will be discussing in detail regarding the gross anatomy histology and function of fallopian tubes followed by any relevant clinical anatomy so objectives of this session are we would be knowing about the parts blood supply innervation histology functions clinical aspects of fallopian tube so the uterine tube is approximately 10 to 12 cm long so the length of the fallopian tube would be around 10 to 12 cm long and 1 to 4 mm in diameter it bridges the gap between the ovary laterally and uterus medially so we can see the ovary on the lateral aspect and uterus on medial side so the fallopian tubes are located within the mesosalphynx which is the fold of peritoneum and it is a component of broad ligament of the uterus and opens medially at the superior angle of the uterus so here is the broad ligament where the fold of peritoneum uh, that is the uh, continuation of the broad ligament forms the mesosalphynx and it opens medially at the superior angle of the uterus so we can see it's opening into the superior angle of the uterus the fallopian tube extends in the superolateral direction and pass superior and anterior to the ovaries and open in the peritoneal cavity lateral to them so you can see lateral to the ovaries they just open into the peritoneal cavity so the uterine tube is divided into five anatomic segments from lateral to medial so the direction uh, an ovum would pass uh, following the ovulation so the lateral most end is the fimbria so fimbria are approximately around 25 finger like projections that drap around over the ovary so we can see here which is drapping around the ovary and the next part is the infundibulum a funnel shaped lateral part that drapes over the ovary with fimbria emanating its form it opens into the peritoneal cavity at the abdominal ostium so this is the infundibulum infundibulum means funnel like so it is a funnel like uh, broader area of the uterine tube where it drapes over the ovary with the fimbria and it opens into the peritoneal cavity at the abdominal ostium so the next widened part is the ampulla which is the widest and the longest section forming over half of the length isthmus isthmus is immediately lateral to the uterus it is the narrowest segment as its name suggests so from here to here is the ampulla the next comes to interstitial or intramural segment the section within the myometrium of the uterus so here this is the intramural part
So these are the parts of the uterine tube or fallopian tube. The arterial supply of the fallopian tube is chiefly from uterine and ovarian arteries. So the uterine arteries are located in the broad ligament and ovarian artery supplies the ovary which are present around the along the mesosalpins. So the ovarian artery before reaching the ovary it gives rise to tubal branches which supply the uterine tube. So the uterine artery supplies medial two thirds of the tube whereas the lateral one third is nourished by the ovarian artery. So lateral th one third the arterial supply is by ovarian artery and medial two thirds the arterial supply is by uterine artery. Venous drainage. The uterine venous plexus drains the medial two thirds of the tubes into the internal iliac veins. So, whereas the pampaniform plexus of veins drains the lateral one third, which drains the lateral one third of the uterine tube, the pampaniform plexus drains into ovarian veins, which in turn drain into renal vein on the left side and the inferior vena cava on the right. Lymphatic drainage, lymph is also drained by both ovarian and uterine vessels which drain into the para-aortic and internal iliac lymph nodes. So let's talk about the innervation. The fallopian tubes are innervated by the autonomic nervous system which includes sympathetic and parasympathetic nerves. The sympathetic nerves arise from T10 to L2 spinal segments. And parasympathetic nerves that supply the medial half of the tube are derived from the pelvic splanchnic nerves. So medial half of the tubes are derived from pelvic splanchnic nerves. Whereas the fibers innervating the lateral half of the fallopian tube are derived from the vagus nerve. So medial half of the tube is innervated by pelvic splanchnic and lateral half of the parasympathetic supply is by vagus nerve. Histology. The walls of the fallopian tubes consists of three main layers. The mucosa, muscularis and serosa. The mucosa is the more predominant at the infundibulum and is sing lined by single layer of tall columnar epithelial cells. And there are three types of columnar cells within the epithelium. Ciliated, non-ciliated, uh, secretory and intercalated cells. So the ciliated cells are more pronounced and mostly seen in the distal portion of the tubes. And develop more cilia in the first part of the menstrual cycle. So the wave-like movement of the cilia responsible for the movement of the ovum throughout the fallopian tubes. Post menopause, the epithelium decreases its in thickness because of the reduction in number of ciliated cells during post menopause. Muscularis layer, it is arranged in two layers, the inner circular and outer longitudinal. Autonomic innervation to these layers responsible for peristaltic contractions of fallopian tubes which helps in propulsion of fertilized ovum. So that was about the histology of fallopian tubes. So the clinical aspects, salpingitis. 
Sanfingitis refers to inflammation of fallopian tube and is a manifestation of pelvic inflammatory disease. Pelvic inflammatory disease is caused by the infection by microorganisms that spread from the endocervix. Many cases are due to the infection with Neisseria gonorrhea or Chlamydia trochomitis. Other organisms that have been implicated in this function are usual vaginal flora including anaerobic organisms, gram-negative bacilli and streptococcus species. Risk factors for this condition include age less than 25 and new or multiple sexual partners and not using barrier contraception. So th these are the predisposing or the risk factors which leads to pelvic uh, infection or salpingitis. Okay, the next condition is endometriosis. The endometrium is the innermost lining or layer of the uterus and its function is to stabilize and support an early pregnancy. So, when fragments of endometrial lining are found outside of the uterine cavity, it is referred to as endometriosis. The exact etiology of this condition is unclear. But the prevailing thoughts are towards the retrograde menstruation. Endometrial fat fragments pushed into the abdomen through the fallopian tubes and localized lymphatic spread. Areas affected can include all abdominal organs but most commonly involved the ovaries, bladder, fallopian tubes and the uterine support ligaments. So each month due to the hormone effect lesions cycle through changes that ultimately lead to the scar tissue and additions. So this cycling process and scarification cause the chronic inflammation and pain. The risk factors include early age of menarche, uh, shorter menstrual cycles, family history, longer menstrual flow and nulliparity. Endometriosis affects approximately 6 to 10 percent of women of reproductive age. Presenting symptoms can be non-specific and variable but may include cyclic pelvic pain and pain with intercourse, abdominal pain, chronic pain, painful periods or pain with uh, bowel movements or a full bladder. So this condition can also be completely asymptomatic and also present as infertility or as an incidental uh, finding at the time of an unrelated surgery. Ligation. Ligation or tying of the fallopian tubes is an effective surgical method of birth control. So this prevents fertilization of the oocyte which then degenerate and become absorbed. There are two methods of ligation. Abdominal tubal ligation and laparoscopic tubal ligation. Abdominal tubal ligation uh, involves a suprapubic incision at the pubic hairline. Laparoscopic tubal ligation on the other hand involves the insertion of parascope through a small incision near the umbilicus. Ectopic tubal pregnancy When a fertilized ovum implants in the mucosa of the fallopian tubes, this is referred to as ectopic tubal pregnancy. This may occur due to the obstruction of fallopian tubes by pus referred to as pyosal. If not detected early, ectopic tubal pregnancy usually results in tubal abortion. A rupture of fallopian tube during the first 8 weeks of gestation. So here we can see the fallopian tube is ruptured showing a developing embryo. So this can cause hemorrhage into the peritoneal cavity. This can lead to the inflammation of parietal peritoneum with the resulting pain referred to the right lower quadrant of the abdomen. A tubal abortion can sometimes be misdiagnosed as acute appendicitis as it causes inflammation of peritoneum in the same area. And hemorrhage from the tubal abortion can also irritate the subdiaphragmatic peritoneum 
which can cause referred pain to the shoulder region via the phrenic nerve. So these are the clinical aspects and normal anatomy of fallopian tubes along with its histology. Thank you.